Hello, hello. And welcome again to a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we talk about what's happening in the news with the Beatles. I'm Ken Michaels, and I'm one of the two co-hosts of this show, and some of you might know me for another Beatles show that I host called Every Little Thing, syndicated around the world, and I'm being joined by Mr. Beatles Examiner himself, that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Uh, Hello, everyone, and uh, I'm also celebrating the uh, World Series victory of the San Francisco Giants today. Yes, yes, you are. (laughs) Why is that so funny? I have to do, no because it's I'm, I'm I'm that's a little in joke between us because you root, were rooting for somebody else we won't discuss <laughs> right yeah oh, okay it's it's All it's right. not the end of the world you know no, Steve no no you I know don't. I don't follow it I don't follow it religiously and passionately like you might but then again you know if it was a New York team if it was the Mets who I that they're my team. Then I'd okay. be excited if they won. So I'm um, congratulations to you. Thank you. Yeah. No, I'm excited. We were uh, we were up uh, watching the game and stayed up uh, a little late last night uh, and uh, it, watching the celebrations on TV and it it was fun. Anyway, now to the subject. Oh, no, my <laughs> my wife was was rooting for San Francisco, but the reason why she rooted for the Giants is because Paul played in San Francisco. Oh, so that's okay. her reasoning behind it. Okay. All right. Okay. If you think anyway, so uh, we got a whole bunch of different news items that we're going to tackle here that happened in the past week, and actually, I should say, past couple of weeks, because I didn't want to talk about the Danny Harrison interview that was in Rolling Stone, because um, you know Danny, I just I, I love when I listen to or read interviews with him. He's just very intelligent, very articulate. And um, I love, you know, his take on everything going on in, in his career and talking when he talks about his father. And obviously with the uh, the George Harrison Apple Years box set just coming out, which Danny was very much involved with, um, you know, he had a lot of things to say in Rolling Stone to David Frick. Actually, it wasn't a very long interview, but it packed a lot of punch as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. So the main things that, that I got out of the interview – I found it very interesting that Danny said that he he finds Wonderwall music to be the most interesting of the albums uh, from from this time period, and I guess a lot of it is uh, a big reason is because it hasn't been explored that much. You know, it's it's an album that uh, you know a lot of people have dismissed over the years and didn't take seriously, and for a lot of people, All Things Must Pass was the beginning of George Harrison's solo career. But a lot of people don't look at the first two albums. And, um, you know, Wonderwall Music, to me, I really love the album quite a lot, you know, because I enjoy the Indian music that George composed. And I found it fascinating that not only did he write those few songs Indian style with the Beatles, Within You, Without You, Love You Too, The Inner Light, but he wrote all this other instrumental stuff long pieces of music at times and uh, the whole process of all that happened I do find fascinating and want to learn more about but um, I thought I'd read a quote here with Danny talking about Wonderwall music Um, he says I remember getting a CD of it in the early 90s and thinking what is this you're sitting there almost meditating to the music literally drooling in your lap then a Shanai, which is an Indian oboe, will come in and practically take the top top of your head off. It's such a deep, psychedelic record. It had Eric Clapton in it. All this backwards guitar, horns, it's a full-on freak-out record, and it was instrumental. Any singing on it was deep Hindu chants. It was a cross of spaghetti Western music, the chants of India things my dad with uh, my dad did with Ravi Shankar, and the Beatles' best freakouts. For people who haven't heard that record, that's the first thing you should listen to in the box. Wonderwall, for my generation, is a title associated with Oasis. It's not. It's one of the first things my dad did on his own away from the Beatles. Danny Harrison it's talking it's there. An, it's an inter- that's an interesting, very interesting perspective on that. Because... You know, as you said, you know, Wonderwall, you know, really kind of got overlooked. Uh, and, and and for a lot of people, it really doesn't, it still doesn't hold that much fascination. But uh, it depends you know, on whether or not you really want to delve into Indian music. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, there is some rock tracks on there, but for the most part, it is Indi- it is Indian music and Indian musicians. It's instrumental, and for a lot of people, you know, it's incidental music to the film. And not many people that I know of listen to soundtrack albums that are all instrumental, regardless of whether it's rock or or Indian music. Mm-hmm. But just the fact that at such a young age he was that heavily into it, and how oh, sure. it was all done. You know, not only composing the music, but what was it like in the studio with these Indian musicians and telling them what to do? How much of that was improvised? You know, I, how much I, did I, George get involved with directing the music? That's that's something I'd like to learn a lot more about. Mm-hmm. I, I find I find the album more interesting in the context of the movie actually than than I do by itself. I mean, I think it's it, it, it it's it's a great mood creator in the in the in terms of the st- the story in the movie as uh-huh. cra- as crazy as that movie is and it's you know i mean that's not a it's not casablanca by any stretch of the imagination but it's i mean it's a it's a period it's a period movie absolutely it's you know it's when it was and it's you know it's you know it was made for the time that it was made for but the you know the the music fits in great in that movie. I, you know, I have to, I have to say, I, I, I don't particularly like listening to it outside the, the movie um, that much. That's my personal opinion. I just don't think it it works as well. I mean, I, but I, I will acknowledge that it's it's Indian music. I think I would personally prefer to hear Ravi Shankar straight than that that particular album but you know that's just it's just i find that interesting that you say that because to me this is and i think i even expressed this in a previous show you know this is a lot more digestible to me because a lot of the pieces are much shorter whereas ravi shankar's pieces can go on for 10 15 minutes oh sure you know that's so in many ways this very deep music intense music is very much like classical music Mm -hmm. um so you have to have a lot of patience to sit through Ravi Shankar's music and long pieces of music like that. Whereas, you know, this, a lot of the tracks that you listen to on Wonderwall music on the album are very short. Mm-hmm. Or they could be four minutes or five minutes. It's much easier to digest, I would say, for most people. But for me, it was a different experience altogether because it took me a long time before I ever saw the film. So for me, I listened to this album a lot before I even got to see the film. Mm-hmm. So I was very familiar with the music. I think I think for me it was the reverse. I think I saw the the movie before because I've I'd seen the video the VHS version a long long time ago, and mm. I don't think I ever I don't think the album was one of my favorites you know years ago, you know back when it first came out as you know and still like I said I like the music in the context of the movie rather than outside of it. But getting back to what you said about Ravi Shankar, I mean I was lucky enough to see him in concert one time. He played my junior college, and it was a very interesting evening because as I re- I, I don't remember for sure. It seems like there were not – it was not a full house. It was a, It was almost a private concert because it was in this gorgeous auditorium, and the place was half full. But he played until late in the evening, and a couple of the pieces were very, very long. And mm. but and so that takes. I mean, we're talking longer than fifteen minutes here, but it was it was an interesting experience to to see him in person like that. But yeah, I mean, this is this is interesting. The the thing about the interview that a lot of people have been carrying away is that we may not see anything rare from the George Harrison archives for a while, which I think is sad in several ways. Number one, because they haven't put out a lot of unreleased stuff. And um, it's just too bad that, uh, and and what little things that have come out, you know, ha- have been fantastic and <laughs> w- witnessed the, the, um, the recent um, demo of Fear of Flying that Olivia Harrison uh, sneaked onto British radio or, or the interview she did recently. I mean, that was just absolutely stunning. And um, it's just, it's just too bad that we aren't going to get more, apparently not going to get more of that anytime soon. 
Um, yeah, I think we should explain true. to people who don't know what, what it is you're talking about there. Olivia was on Jules Holland show, Jules Holland's mm-hmm. uh, BBC radio show. Right. And she she actually snuck on a minute's worth of a demo that George made for a song called Fear of Flying, which happens to be a song that was first recorded by and written by an artist named Charlie Dore, who's a British singer-songwriter. And a lot of people may know this big hit that she had back in 1979 called Pilot of the Airwaves. Do you remember that, Steve? No, never heard of that. <laughs> Okay, well, it was a top 20 hit in the United States, but I think a lot of people, when I mention that, will are familiar with that song. But um, Olivia Harrison gave an interview when Living in the Material World, the documentary, came out, and she was talking about Early Takes Volume 1, how she wanted that CD to be more inclusive to the film. Uh, I guess mm-hmm. she didn't think of it as a separate release. But when they were going through the archives... She was mentioning that George had recorded a lot of stuff and not just songs that are his own. And she mentioned Nina Simone, the George covered Nina Simone. I don't know Mm -hmm. how many songs. And she mentioned Charlie Dorr. But then she also said, you know, she didn't want the accompanying soundtrack to Living in the Material World to be nine CDs. She wanted it to be more connected to the early part of George's career when he was just starting out Mm -hmm. and to be a more intimate experience, which is why early takes volume one was one CD. So, uh, but she mentioned Charlie door in that interview a couple of years ago. And here on this radio program, she played a minute of this demo and it sounds really great. And apparently what had happened was Charlie door got to visit the Harrisons at their home. And this mm-hmm. was either in, in 1979, 1980, and George made a demo of that song, Fear of Flying, which was also a single for her. And I think it was the single before Pilot of the Airwaves. And it didn't do that well. And uh, But uh, I guess, you know, she introduced that song to George, and George made a demo of it, and they played a minute of it, and it sounded great. And it's just him on acoustic guitar. And I could certainly, I would love to hear the whole thing, obviously. Um, and I could have heard a full band treatment of this song. And uh, it's really nice, very nice melody. It almost, to me, has a bit of a melodically like a Hawaiian feel. <laughs> I don't know why I, that, I was thinking about that, but you do think about that with George since, uh, you know, he wrote stuff in Hawaii and he also lived. He had a home in Hawaii, but mm-hmm. it had a Hawaii, it has a Hawaiian feel to me anyway. But, um, yeah, so she gave us a little taste of um of this song and uh but danny going back to this interview was talking about the unreleased george harrison music and um you know he he basically said that he put a lot of love and care into this new box set and you know i think he's he's very upset at the people who are complaining that there's not enough unreleased material on there and uh it's kind of like you can't please everybody and you know, he also gives you the impression that, you know, he has a life of his own. He has his own band, the new number two. You know, he has to focus on that, too, as well as tend to his father's archives. And that's it's it's a very big task to go through all the archives and to pick out what you think is worthy of being released. And he even went as far as to say in this interview that his father was very um, he said, my dad was very conscious of people scraping the barrels he hated that i'm not obliged to anyone to put out stuff that is not up to what he would consider his standards okay so you know he's being very truthful very honest and so i just think that we have to wait and see when the next batch of unreleased harrison comes out i was under the impression that uh with giles martin working on Early Takes Volume 1, that this would be an ongoing thing, maybe once every couple of years. Right. Uh, it, may, it may take longer than that. Yeah. So, um, but, you know, the, the question remains, and, and nobody can answer this, how much unreleased stuff is there? I do remember, and it's, it's often been quoted, that uh, George gave an interview in Billboard magazine to Timothy White. I think this was around the time of the Yellow Submarine song track. When he said that uh, I've got more unreleased stuff in the vaults than Jim Reeves. So how much of that is actually unreleased songs of his that have never been heard? 
how much of it are our songs that he covered, how much of it are demos, how much of it are alternate mixes or outtakes of of uh, songs in the studio. Uh, there there probably is a lot, but um, uh, you just get the impression that it's going to be done with a lot of care uh, when it does come out, and it's not going to come out until the time is right. So, right. Uh, you know, I guess that's that's the difficult thing when you're the fan and you see things a certain way, and you want you want all the unreleased stuff to come out, right? Or right. the best of the unreleased stuff. And you know, the artist sees things a different way. And one of the things that we've talked about here on this show, and I think it should be apparent to every Beatle fan, is that the Beatles are very sensitive to what what's released. They only put out what they thought was the best of their material. And in some ways, I do believe that it's somewhat of a miracle that the three double CDs of the Beatles anthology ever came out. Oh, <laughs> because, sure. I uh, mean, I mean, given all the all the um, changes to, you know, that uh, occurred with, um, I think it was Anthology 2, either 2 or 3, you know, and there was actually, uh, there was actually, they actually printed up booklets for one of them before they changed it, you know. And, mm. uh, so, I mean, yeah, that's crazy. By the way, what I was going to say was that that Jules Holland program, the entire program is online on the BBC site, and you can hear it even here in America. And all and but the demo itself is on YouTube. If you look up "Fear of Flying" and you look up, you know, something within the last month, so you Man. can hear just, just the demo. But uh, the whole pro, the whole Jews Holland program is online. So, but there's an important point to make here: is that we we would like the Beatles, we'd like all of them to think like we do, <laughs> and so many of the fans want the, the unreleased stuff to come out. And I'm always reminded now, and this is just something that keeps popping into my my head, the interview that we did, and also I did one privately with Dave Morrell, when Mm -hmm. he was talking about when he he met Paul McCartney during uh, the Press to Play launch, and he was talking about uh, the Sessions album that was supposed to come out at the time, and uh, they were talking about various tracks and everything, and Dave was saying, what about this, this take of of Strawberry Fields Forever and, and Paul saying, what take? You know? And then Paul said to him, listen to the release version. You can't get any better than that. And that's probably how they think. You know? I mean, for fans who love to hear alternate takes and they want to hear the process and the evolution of the songs, it's all very fascinating. You know, not only is it fascinating musically, but from a historical perspective, I think it's important for all this stuff to come out doesn't mean they have to feel that way. No, and they don't. And that and that's where I mean that's where bootlegs come in. That's where the you know that unsurpassed master series was such a re- revelation, uh, the ultra rare series way back when. Uh-huh. That's why we, you know, that's why we paid big bucks for that stuff back then, and, you know, because it was just it was so amazing to listen to. You know, I I remember when the anthology stuff came out, a lot of people were really disappointed that Ringo said, you know, this is it. This is all there is. Well, it was, everybody knew otherwise that there wasn't all there is, but they don't see it the same way that we do. You know. And so, maybe that's exactly how Ringo feels, that this is the best of what was left. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. That's probably, that's probably very true. Um, or at least that's the line he's going he's gonna to tell everybody that, you know, that... Uh, because, I mean, they've heard it all. They don't, you know, it's not something, it's not like they need to hear it again. They've heard it. You know, they've lived through it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I mean, it, it, is in, uh, it is interesting to hear, you know, all that stuff and, and the little bits and pieces that continue to surface um, now. Uh, I mean, the, the golden era is long gone, but the little bits and pieces that, that continue to surface are, are you know, are fun. So. Yeah, but this is something. This is something that carries into the solo careers too. I mean, in many ways, and I've just gotten the the um, the Venus and Mars Wings to the Speed of Sound remasters, and I'm treasuring all the bonus audio there. You know that there's so much more that can come oh, out, sure. but I'm grateful. I'm just grateful that this is out. You know, because uh, all four of them are very sensitive to their unreleased material. I think you know, it's not like they're just going to release everything. You know, I think 
from a historical perspective because they are who they are. Everything they've ever done is important. But that doesn't mean that they have to see it that way. Something that we find fascinating to listen to, they may think is garbage and not worthy of release. And so to expect the fan and to expect the artist to, to look at things exactly the same way is just unrealistic. But, uh, you know, I'm reveling right now in the McCartney stuff. So I think uh, the, the thing about the McCartney stuff that I really like is the, the clarity on that on the new on the discs. I think they mm. sound incredibly clear. As far as the unreleased stuff goes, you know, I think there should have been a lot more. As I've, I've said this before. You know, um, if you're going to put stuff out, if you're going to give people unreleased stuff. At least give them, you know, a little uh, a little more taste of you know some unreleased stuff, like they like what happened on the new collector's edition, where you know they just put out very little. I think you could you could be a little less you know a little less restrictive on and be a little freer on opening up some of the. Uh, um, the unreleased tracks. That's just that's me. Um, even if you don't want to give a ton, you know, um, at least give a little more if you're going to do it at all. Otherwise, you know, why bother? Why, you know? But that's my. Oh, I that's would I wouldn't say why bother. I mean, even if you just gave one song, an unreleased song, I think it's worth it. Well, obviously, I want more, but uh, no, I mean. You talk about the new, the deluxe, and we were talking about that in, in the last show. As far as I'm concerned, and I didn't bother to say this in our, in our previous show, but given the price of the new deluxe, obviously to get the album with the same tracks, it, it, it's, it's, it's kind of pointless. You know, The only people who are interested in, in the new deluxe are the people who bought the album in the first place. But right. just to get the documentary of something new and to get the three unreleased songs, although Struggle did come out in Japan, and to get the four live cuts, and to get the videos for, for four of the songs, and the making of the videos for three of the songs, I think it's worth it. Obviously, I wish there was more, but, um, you know, I, I'd still worth my while. You know, anytime, yeah. when you think about the fact that there were so many import CD singles that Paul has released through the years, where it cost 15 bucks just to get the the CD single and you've got two or three extra songs, this is kind of the same thing, only you get a DVD to go along with it, and the documentary is wonderful, and you get, and then you get the video, so I, you know, and you get the bonus song, so I kind of feel like it's worth it. When you have artists such as, say, for example, the Beach Boys, the Bee Gees, the Kinks, putting out sets... Um, with a lot of unreleased tracks, the, the Kinks BBC set comes to mind. The Bee Gees um, set with the first three albums comes to mind, where they mm. had entire discs of bonus tracks. And I mean a lot. We're talking a lot here. I I don't, I don't think I'm alone in in wishing that there was a little bit more. Granted, the Beatles don't have to do that. You know, they you know they are who they are, and you know they know that we'll be happy. Um, but I just I just kind of feel that way. But I want more too. I'm not different in that regard. Okay. You know, but to expect the Beatles and for anything by the group, you've got four camps there to answer to, or for Paul or Ringo individually, or John and George and their estates. You know, it, it's you, you can't expect them to feel the same way as as we do. No, I, I don't. So they handle it. I mean, you know, that's all that I'm saying. They have to. They they're looking at it from you know from a number of different perspectives. Obviously, um, financial being one of them. So it's. You know, but they're also sensitive to their own works. Oh sure, as is, as is every artist. That's not you know they're they're not alone in that regard. But what's the next topic? Uh, let's talk about Jack Bruce. Hmm. Yeah, that was a tremendous loss, and. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's certainly one of the great bass players of all time, and certainly an influential bass player. And, you know, I'm reading a lot of quotes since his passing from, uh, you know, various people. And I, I love hearing other musicians talk about him. And, you know, when it, when it reaches, you know, a lot of different genres of music, like I heard a quote from Flea, from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, you mm -hmm. know, someone like him. You know, the influence can, can reach so many different artists in different genres. And, um, 
you know, he was he was a tremendous loss. There's no doubt about it. And um, certainly where the Beatles are concerned, he was in three of the all star bands with Ringo. And there's only a few other people you can even who can even make that claim. Right. So it tells you how much Ringo enjoyed having him in the band. And, um, you know, those bands that he was in with the all stars were tremendous. Oh, yeah. They and, were. Uh, Great. Like all of them were. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was just a. Uh, Ringo loves being in the company of extremely talented players like the All Stars are. And so, you know, to have someone certainly from his generation, you know, to have him in the band, and uh, they were cooking, you know, those bands, especially oh, right. Jack Bruce with, with Peter Frampton. And, you know, it, it's, that's an amazing band there. And to have Gary Brooker and those people, Simon Kirk. Um, you know, all the people that were in those three bands, that was an amazing, amazing experience. And don't I, forget, obviously, when you think of Jack Bruce and you think about any Beatle connection, you have to think about Badge and right. what a memorable bass line he brought to that song. And it's the only, the only song that we know of written by George and Eric Clapton. So uh, a big part of, of Beatle history and certainly music history. Right, and um, yeah, I, I seem to remember the night that I saw them, I saw um, Jack Bruce, the, the tour with Gary Brooker. Um, Ringo made a point to say how proud he was that he had Brooker and Jack Bruce and Frampton in the same band. And, yeah. You know, to get to hear songs like, uh, um, you know, Sunshine of Your Love, um, you know. White Room. Stage. White Room, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that, you know, uh, um, that was just absolutely, he was just very proud of that. And and uh, I saw Bruce again um, in Hippie Fest a couple of years ago, um, and that was, oh, wow. uh, that was very exciting. That was great. He, he, he obviously was on his own at that point, you know, doing his own set, but that was, um, that was really good, too. I, I believe he was the, the, um, the headliner that night. Um, so, yeah, that was a great, that was a great show. And at the opening, of the show that night was um, Joey Molland. Joey Molland, yeah. So I got to see Joey Molland, and, and uh, Mitch Ryder was also on that, on that show. So uh, that was uh, an interesting show. But anyway, he was he was a, a quite a musician, quite a musician. Those yeah, not just a great musician; he's a great singer. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a great songwriter, too. So many of I'm, the Cream songs were, were uh, written or co-written by him. Yeah, and I'm so glad that they that Cream got back together in 2005, you know, for that one tour. It was great to hear them again. Um, I have not heard uh, – Bruce put out a new album this year, and I have not heard that, unfortunately. Um, but um, uh, I'll bet that was uh, uh, it was a great album. Uh he had Robin Trower and Phil Manzanera from Roxy Music on that uh, on the album, and some of the songs were written by Pete Brown, who uh, did the lyrics for Cream. Mm. So that uh, should be uh, should be a very interesting album. Yeah, and also um, George Harrison appeared on uh, one of Jack Bruce's early albums, "Songs for a Tailor," and uh, he played guitar on a song called "Never Tell Your Mother She's Out of Tune." That's the first. That's the uh, that was Jack Bruce's debut. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah, but uh, that was just, that was sad to read about that. Very, very sad. And he came up he came up through. I mean, he was a veteran. He played in a lot of uh, bands. He played with Graham Bond. He played with Manfred Mann. He played with Alexis Corner, um, who also, by the way, Alexis Corner also had played with us at various times. Mick Jagger and um, Robert Plant. So there you go. Um, mm. Great, you know, great, uh, great musician and uh, a big, big, big loss. Yeah. So. And actually, Eric Clapton, for those that don't know, he actually um, posted an instrumental yeah, on his did. website uh, as a, a tribute to him called For Jack, which you mm -hmm. should uh, check out. Yep. Yep. So. All right, we got uh, just a couple more things to bring up, and one of which is for um, Record Store Day, they're going to be releasing 
the Beatles EP of Long Tall Sally. Right. They're going to uh, re-release that. It's going to be taken from the uh, analog tapes, as were the the uh, mono uh, box set, or I should say, as was the mono box set. And that's going to be uh, on Black Friday, uh, November 28th, at your local favorite record store. And uh, I guess I guess a lot of record stores are taking part in this now, which is really good. The only problem is that, according to Record Store Day, uh, there's no guarantee that your local record store is going to carry every particular release, so you have to check with your record stores. But I would guess to say a Beatles vinyl EP is going to be uh, is going to be all over the place. And of course, there are lim- there are limited editions, but it should be a fairly you shouldn't have to drive 300 miles, hopefully, to unless you don't have a record store close to you to get one. Mm. So. Okay, and one more thing to talk about, and I found this really interesting, is that um, Paul McCartney has started something new, no pun intended, um, on his website, and that is that he's offering free, a free music download, which looks like this could be an ongoing thing. And um, there's a link there that you can find for downloads, and he's, uh, he's featuring a different version of Letting Go, which yep. you can download for free. So, uh, really cool idea. This this particular version uh, is without the brass section that we're used to hearing on the um, the album version and the single version. And so, it is definitely different from the one on the album and the single. It actually goes on a little bit longer, too. So, uh, yeah, just a, a nice feature. And, and if he continues to offer free downloads, that would be a really cool thing to yeah, have on his website. Was- it would be. Um, uh, it's it's a. It sounds very close to the to the studio take. Um, it's hard to say whether it's a um, a, a mix down of the you know the, the studio version or it's a different take. It sounds real close to it. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know. I think I personally think it's a different take, and it's just very it's very close. Um, obviously, I mean it it was recorded right near where the studio take was cuz the sound is pretty cl- pretty similar but it's hard to say definitively one way or the other but it's it's great that you get to get it free that's the that's the good part mm. so and also he he actually did something on the website recently to promote Venus and Mars and Wings at the Speed of Sound he had a microsite in which he um he had information about all the different songs from both albums Right. And it's a, a really cool thing to see. You know, it's a great way to promote both albums. Well, I, yeah, I mean, the Beatles have been known to to do that kind of thing a lot. Um, and but in this particular case, it was actually it was actually a, a fun place to to go around to look around. I remember the one that George Harrison did for uh, All Things Must Pass when he reissued that. Um, that was very cool too. But uh, yeah, this is this was uh, very nicely done pictures and and uh, lots of information it wasn't just a um a re uh, uh treading of the press releases so it actually had some real information on it so it's, it's yeah awesome. i so, just love the fact that for each song there's information there that you may not have heard about before right. so he's adding more and more stuff to his website to make it more interesting and and giving you more reasons to go to his website which is a great thing He's keeping it very interactive, which uh, after the the initial promise of the the paid part, um, he's really kind of upped the ante a little bit, which is which is good because you don't have to pay for it. That's that's nice rather than have to pay fifty bucks a year as he as he originally had planned. Um, you're getting a lot of stuff for you know for free now, um, but um, so that that's that's. You know that's good. He's uh, it. It is a great website. I have to say, it's there's a lot to do there, and it's not just a, a very thin website. They've really got a lot of people working on it. Uh, you can tell. You know, there's a lot of artists out there that have their own websites that's not so developed. Mm-hmm. You know, but he must he must have a team of people working on this. So. Oh, oh yeah, I'm sure he does. Uh, I mean. Yeah, it's it's pretty obvious when you see how many sections they have. So, all right, so that pretty much puts the show to a close. 
And uh, if you would like to get in touch with us, you can write to us at our email address, which is things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. If you'd like to get in touch with me directly, you can write to my email address, every little thing at att.net. And by all means, if you can, check out my website, kenmichaelsradio.com, with Beatles trivia and prizes given away every single week and lots of great interviews and special contests. And uh, actually, right now, I'm giving away the deluxe new on my website. So, uh, but by the time this gets posted, it'll be too late to win. But <laughs> I'm giving it away in my weekly trivia. So, uh, something to take a look at. And there's all kinds of really cool prizes that I give away every single week. So, if you can, KenMichaelsRadio.com. And also, join my Facebook page, Ken Michaels, and our Facebook page, Things We Said Today. And if people want to get in touch with you, Steve? They can get to my personal Facebook page. They can join my Beatles News and Commentary group uh, on Facebook where I, I post news and, and we can talk about it. And I've got all sorts of stuff going on, little all sorts of Beatles news that uh, I'm coming up with. So keep in touch with me. Subscribe to me on Beatles exam, on examiner.com for all my columns, not just Beatles, but uh, I have other columns too. Just look me up and you'll see what I do. And Even Weird Al Yankovic, what can I say? Anyway, there we go. All right, so for things we said today, I'm Ken Michaels thanking all of you for listening, and I'll see you next time. And I'm Steve Marinici for things we said today, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.